All right, it's time to get this thing going. Please welcome to the stage our first performing poet. It's Gracie Mayer. Hi, um, my name is Gracie Mayer, and this poem is called Stretch in a Garden. Hello, I would say new crush, but God, crush doesn't feel right. No, it's more than that. It's more than that. It's stretch. My whole body clenches in the shoulders by extends in the limbs when I think of you. Your name is my hyperextension, my hyperfixation. Your name is printed on my neck. You were the tag labeled angel's kiss that I so badly don't want to rip off, but I have to because it scratches and I have sensory issues. It's not really your name, because I hate your name. It's so bland, it's so boring, and it doesn't apply. You were just another straight white boy to me a minute ago. You were just another person my brain chooses for my fantasies. But I think, I think this is more than that. I want to get to know you. As a friend, sure, but something more than that. And not even romantic or sexual, no spiritual. I want to, want to look into your eyes, and I want to see a glimpse of what is beyond. I want to stare into the blazing, roaring sun that is that darn head of yours. You call yourself stupid, but I have never met anyone who loves like you do. You seem to love everyone, and I can't understand how. I like it. I like you. I tell my friends about you. And as usual, they say they're putting me into a blender so I can spin and spin until my brain is crushed up into mush and I can't think of you anymore. They make fun of you, just how I like it. I say your flaws, we gossip. I know, I know that's mean, but it's their tradition. And it's the only thing that's keeping me from kneeling down and proposing we marry at a beautiful wedding next Montana, next Friday, 5 p.m. To you, as my crush of the week. I don't think I feel that way with you. I want to take walks with you. I want to do all of the cliches, but with a genuine interest. I want to tuck away all of those fantasies. I want to stop writing about it and start grabbing your face and saying and staring into your eyes and saying, I love you. I love you. I love you, Loki. I want to succeed in life, and I believe you can, even though I know this won't work. I love you enough. I'm so glad you exist to be with anyone. I love you like grabbing onto my father's leg when I was little. And him having to take these slow, giant steps to walk across the living room. Like the number on your jersey and your god-awful cough. Like grabbing you and grabbing you and grabbing you. I love you like cuteness aggression. I love you how, like how I want to kiss you like how chickens peck. Over and over and aggressively until it hurts. I love you and I want to kiss something that is beyond you. Something deeper and more complex, but also somehow more solid. Something more real. Something we can't understand. I love you, look, I want to see your failures. I love you when my friends insult you, though I don't care what they say because it can never change how I feel about you. You are above any word, any name, any image my mind procures for you. I want to see it. I want to see who you really are. I want to pry open that box. I want to see that bright, overwhelming light that is filled in every cavity of your body. But I also want to see the supremely dark parts. I want to see and taste the things that kind of taste funny. I want to see what has rotted and what has bloomed and what has never happened. And most of all, most of all, I want to leave a shoe print in your garden because you have left many in mine. Thank you. Something I didn't do last round that I was supposed to do is I'm going to give you guys the total of those scores uh, after we get them. Um, and that's going to make it easier for you poets to be kind of tracking things in your head, right? Um, all right. Did I give you enough time? Some of you look like you're ready. Uh, let's start with Janelle. What do you got? 8.5. Fitz. 8.3. Mark. 8.8. Mark. 8.9. Meredith, 8.2. And now they're tabulating the totals where I stand here awkwardly. Oh, yeah. Water's good. It's really good. Ooh, you're going to need a new marker. 25.6.
All right, please welcome to the stage our next poet, Helena Rink. Pretty, ooh, pretty little poems. I hate pretty little poems. They're like broken bones with painful tones. They're dark like stones, so I hate pretty little poems. They're spun by fools who have no clue of my broken back laid out fat due to the fact of the higher class working me to my bones. They say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And they ought to think such words are nothing more than blank terms. They say these words like slimy worms. They're written to men, not meant to mend my broken bones. <sighs> so I hate pretty little poems. They're thrown like stones to sick made homes, crashing through the handmade glass. <sighs> crashing through the handmade glass. Pretty little poems should be more than blank terms thrown like stones. Pretty little poems should bend my mind, make me cry, because you finally said what I've been meaning, needing, pleading for anyone to say. So I hate those pretty little sp poems spun by fools who think poetry is just words, terms, worms, bend, mend, bones. You have broke my bones. So I hate your pretty little poems. Quit spinning those handmade tales of my painful wails like they're nothing more than stick the stick-made homes you've harmed before. Please, mend my broken bones. Please, Bend my mind and let me cry. C please quit throwing your stones and change your tone. For then, I will love your pretty little poems. Thank you. If I make it through the night and I at no point eat it on those stairs, I expect a standing ovation, and nothing less. All right, um, I, uh, for those of you keeping score, um, we have had one lakeside poet and one riverside poet, um, and that's in order. Um, so I know, I know some people are in their head are like, I'm, I'm rooting for a school more than a poet. I'm sure mo most of you here are doing that. All right, let's get some scores. Shut up, Ross. Um, let's, let's start on the other end this time. Let's start with Meredith. 7.1! Oh, Mark! 7.1! Mark! 7.9! Uh, <laughs> Fitz! 7.6! Kind of rhymed. That was cool. Did you hear that? Uh, Janelle, <laughs> seven point two. Oh, all right. And tabulating the totals. <laughs> Twenty-one point nine. All right. Out of Lakeside High School, our next poet is Archie Smith. Hi, I'm Archie Smith, and this is Stained Jeans and Apples. It's a spring evening, wind is blowing, leaves are rustling, sun peaks from behind splotches in the sky. Birds chirp, bees buzz, flowers flourish and petals petal across the cloud-spotted blue sky. The clouds look like bleach stains on an old pair of jeans found in a barn, left by a farner, farmer who set them there and forgot to bring them back the next day, telling his wife he'd attempt again to remove the stains. Stains are difficult to remove, sometimes nearly impossible. It could only be easier if they'd be gone in a flash, just disappeared, just like that. Below those stained skies, an apple tree stands tall and proud, bearing the reddest of apples, untouched by maggots, worms, bugs, or rot. It stands basking in the sun's rays, healthy and pure. The air cools. An icy frost catches the dew on the grass below. The sun hides its face behind the clouds, afraid of what's to come. The apple tree stands, unaware of the chilling of the air, though so obvious. 
A man wanders under the stained sky, spotting the lonely apple tree. The tree shivers as he approaches. He wears an intensely wide but false smile. The frost follows him as he approaches the tree. He pulls the branch, twisting, ripping, tugging, tearing, bending, breaking. It snaps. He now holds the apple firmly in his hand, biting into it quickly and tossing it to the side as if it was barely worth his time. Sap stains his jeans. Thank you, Archie. All right. Judges tabulating scores. Janelle, what do you got? 7.5. Fitz. 7.9. Mark. 7.2. Mark. 7.5. Meredith. 7 even. (laughs) Meredith, we're going to have words later. All right. That gives us a total. 22.2. That's a cool number. Good job, Archie. All right. Let's bring up our next poet from Riverside High School. It's Charlie Marcourt. I can't stand kids these days. They're loud and disruptive and they don't know how to read. They don't know how to read. They don't know how to read because they don't like school and they were taught to read by sounding words out. Words that make no sense. Words like orange and thesis and juxtaposition and synonym and epidemic and we epidemic and we have an epidemic on our hands. The kids are illiterate. They don't know how to read anything. They don't know how to read books, or they don't know how to read people, or they don't know how to read a room. Get a room! The kids these days don't know how to get a room. These kids are making kids in hallways and bathrooms, and they're flirting with life every single day. They make jokes about their lives about their lives. They make jokes about their lives, and I can see why. We don't treat the kids these days like kids, so the kids play pretend. They pretend to be kids. They pretend to read, they pretend to live, they pretend they want to live. They don't like pretending they want to live, so they paint stripes with razor blades. Because if they can't pretend to live, they'll try to fix the problem. They'll fix the problem. They can't fix the problem. The problem is that kids these days have problems, but the problems aren't their own, but the grown-ups can't figure it out, so the kids will take the problems and shove them as far down as they can because that's how you fix problems. You ignore problems. You ignore the problem. You guys are ignoring the problem. The problem is that you're shoving things in a hole. You can't just shove things in a hole and cover them up. Cover them up with words or paper or alcohol or nicotine or Jesus or weed or school or poetry. You can't just cover them up because the problem is still there under the blanket. You say, I can't see it. It's not there. Or it's not my problem. You can figure it out. Or pick up a book and learn how to read. Or I can't stand kids these days. The kids these days are starving. They are hungry, they're hungry for love, for home, for words, for a will to live. The kids these days are tired. They're tired because they live in a world where problems are ignored and dismissed. They're tired because they do the same thing over and over and over and over again until it kills them. Do me a favor and find one of the kids from these days. Tell them you love them, give them a hug, and tell them that they just have to wait a little longer. Because one day, they won't be the kids from these days. I am one of the kids from these days, and I can tell you that the kids these days are tired because they keep hearing that you can't stand the kids these days. Well, guess what? Kids these days can't stand you anymore. They can't stand you anymore, and they're not going to. Four for four on the stairs. Oh, 
you know, I did something for you, audience, that, that this is behind the scenes. This is the extra mile I go for you. I kind of threatened the judges before we got started here to get their scores in fast. Because I've done this years where I'm standing up here like, <sighs> come on. This year, they're on it. It's great. Janelle, what do you got? Ten! Woo! Fitz! 8.0! Mark! 9.0! Mark! 9.1! Meredith making last second changes. 8.1! All right. Bring our next poet from Riverside High School. It's Eleanor Brown. I wish I could remember every inch of my childhood, every aspect of the now dead girl that I spent all my time with, every pet now gone or aging, every gift I ended up getting, every memory not marred with the passing of time because it hasn't been that long, right? I guess I want to remember in a feeble way of holding on to the past, of pushing change and age temporarily back, if I could just remember what it was like when I took the training wheels off my bike, whenever my brother and I had a fight or a plot to take over the world. When the world consisted of the tiny living room in our childhood home, when adventures extended only to our 12-acre backyard and not halfway across the globe, when friends were made and kept because of proximity. We rode the same bus, lived on the same street. It was kismet that we'd meet. When those friendships didn't end in tragedy and me staring at an urn, clutching a white rose, a heavy heart, and a whole lot of love to mourn, but instead ended one day at a time with an I'll see you tomorrow. Because mom's home, the bugs are out, it's time to take a bath. There's spaghetti on the stove after I wash up and leave my muddy shoes out back. Oh, how I wish I could go back. Even if it's only in my mind, in my heart, in my resolve. Would it bring me some sort of closure if those memories felt a little bit closer? Because if I could just remember more than what my 17-year-old brain can recall, I might be just able to push 18 down my childhood home's hall and out that metal back door. I'd shove the responsibility of growing up out the window I had to climb through and I got locked out. I'd hide deadlines for applications under my old paint chip desk so that I could possibly forget. The sleep-deprived nights while scholarships passed me by and the missing assignments that I still haven't done. Because on March 11th, I became an adult. So how come that makes me want to hide in a blanket fort? I feel simultaneously way too old and impossibly young. I couldn't possibly be 18. That's 18 too many years, and I feel like I've just started when really I'm right near the precipice of change, which, by the way, I hate. And it may be a rite of passage, walking across that stage, shaking hands, giving a wave, but receiving a piece of paper doesn't make me more mature. Throwing my cap in the air doesn't make me capable of figuring it all out, because becoming a graduate doesn't immediately graduate you from who you were. Before that one fleeting, ever-important moment. That's all it always is, is moments. And I wish to remember every little moment from when I was a kid. Because then maybe, just maybe, I can keep the child within. All right, judges. Janelle? 9.2 fits. 8.5, Mark, 8.6, Mark is furiously erasing, let's skip to Meredith, 8.9, and from Mark, a 9.0, 26. 26.5, our next poet from Lakeside High School, it's Ava Hattenberg. Okay. Beneath the ancient olive groves where whispering winds carry sorrow, a child's eyes open like skies, 
Like open skies, reflect dreams of a peaceful morrow. Their hands, small and uncalloused, reach up, pleading for the sun, grasping for warmth, for light, for the freedom to run. No more the sound of sirens, nor the shattering of night. Let them know the quiet strengths of stars shining ever so bright. Their laughter should dance with the leaves, not tremble at the blast. In a land where shadows of olive trees grow long, not ca cast by a ghastly past. From the rumble of yesterdays, their innocence peers, questioning the reasons for the conflict, the root of all their fears. Why? They ask, must our playgrounds be lined with scars? Can we paint our futures not with strife, not with the strokes of Mars? Their hearts, tender vessels of hope, pump not hatred, but dreams. Dreams of kites, not drones, and skies, and paper boats, and streams. They yearn for classrooms free of echoes from a fighter jet scream, for a life where living is more than a mere beam. In their eyes, the universe speaks a language pure and true, a dialect of possibility of a world they never knew, a world where hands are held in unity, not raised in defense, where boundaries are drawn by love and not barbed wire fences. They deserve more than a narrative written in blood and pain. They deserve the pen, the paper, to write their own refrain, to sing of day, days filled with play and not with the walls of Barrett, to be authors of their own destiny with ink of hope, not theft. Let the walls crumble, not from bombs, but from empathy's might. Let the checkpoints dissolve into the horizon out of sight. Freeing Palestine from the hate, from the harm, from the endless night is freeing childhoods from the grip of perpetual fright. Their childhoods have been stolen by war, yet they still dream of peaceful days, playing hide and seek in the crumbling streets, hoping for, fu for a future free from fear. Let them be saved. Let them once again be safe. For in their struggle, we find our humanity. In their resilience, we find our unity. And as the curtain falls on this poetic stage, let their stories echo through history's page. For in their perspective, we find our truth. In their innocence, we find our youth. A tale of peace for Palestine, a message of love we send. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, whoever's tracking that. Appreciate you. All right, Janelle, what do you got? 8.0. Fitz, 8.7. Mark, 8.1. Mark, 7.3. Meredith, 7.9. We got a total coming up. Exactly 24 points. From Riverside High School, please welcome to the stage, Ariana Reimer. Humans are like butterflies. We are fragile beings with emotions like wings. They can get broken and it takes time to heal them. Think back to your sixth grade year. That's when we started lending negativity in ear. How do I look? Do I need to wear makeup? Am I strong enough? Do I need to do a sport? Popularity comes to the beautiful and beautiful comes to hurt the butterflies who aren't graced with such features. We go through a metamorphosis at only ages 10 to 12. We start caring about things that are insignificant to what really matters, except that now our society made it matter. Some of us look like butterflies, like society intends, while others are treated like mosquitoes because her hair is messy, his skin is dark, he's too short, she's too tall, their eyes are weird, it's too fat, she's too skinny, his scars are ugly, and now, since they have been spoken against, their wings are torn. 
She's now crying in front of her mirror. Why is she tall? Why is her hair messy? Why is she skinny? And he is now lying in his bed. Why is his skin so dark? Why is he so short? Why are his scars even fair in the first place? They're sitting at the dinner table, shoving their food from one side of the plate to another. Why are their eyes different colors? Why isn't their skincare good? Why aren't their clothes trendy? It's reading a book, unable to focus. Why does it weigh so much? Why is it so lonely? Why does no one respect its pronouns? The butterflies are crying. They're crying because the people who look beautiful have said things that hurt. Some of these butterflies won't migrate from the thoughts of their insecurities, and now they hate how they look, they hate how they act, and they hate how they feel. But now we take a closer look at the beautiful butterflies, the ones that decide to make fun of others, the ones that look different because their hair is covered their, their skin is covered in makeup, their hair is styled beyond recognition, and their mind is swimming in thoughts of insecurities. If I'm not pretty, I'm useless. If I'm not head of the football team, I'm weak. If I let my diet slip, I'll become ugly. If I don't do my skincare routine, I'll become ugly. And if we are not popular, we are nothing. And so they cover themselves up. They make themselves think they're better, and they ridicule the innocent to make their hurt go away. So you see... We are all butterflies. We are all unique. We are all strong. We are all brave. And we are all beautiful. Thank you for your time, butterflies. Very hard not to come up here like a butterfly. <laughs> You are all beautiful butterflies. Me too. All right, Janelle, 8.7, Fitz, 8.4, Mark, 8.4, Mark, 8.5, Meredith, 7.4. You know, you know what they do, right, Meredith? They just throw out your score. They just throw it out. You got to give better scores. It's just like it's like you weren't even here. All right. <laughs> All right. Our next total. Our next total is twenty five point three. All right. Let's bring up the next board from Riverside Ice. Crean German. I finished 40 episodes in 24 hours. Don't ask me how that's possible. I give it all to my depression and ADHD and all the chemical imbalances that sometimes take over for me because I lose control of my self-control and suddenly it won't stop. The voice is in my head telling me to go on. Then 24 hours later and in my mind not a second has passed and yet it feels like seven years has gone by in a flash. It's like the dopamine and serotonin aren't actually sure what they're supposed to do. So I go back to what I do best. Sitting in one position for days on end, all electronics running and plugged in. It's like my eyes can't leave the screen because I'm suddenly living that life. My actions become reflections of their emotions and vice versa to the same effect. When they're sad, I remember all the horrible moments from my past. When they succeed, suddenly I'm right there with them. I blame it on my empathy and the part of my brain that's not satisfied because I get more excited when the characters on the screen accomplish something than ever have been for my own life. I feel their sorrow deeper than mine, and their anger makes my blood boil. Watching one of them scream and cry makes my heart drop four levels, and suddenly I'm so addicted to this made-up storyline that for 24 hours or more, I'm completely absorbed in someone else's life. I'm the character and the narrator, all at the same time. I'm standing right by their side and still somehow watching through their eyes. Whatever messed up chemicals were spilled inside my head are suddenly cleaning themselves up to match the female leads instead. Now I'm no longer me. I don't have the same body. I'm so empathetically involved that I can't recall my own story. Did I attempt to save the world but watch my parents die instead? Was I hit by a truck? Did I have a past life? What did I do to get stuck where I am? Then I remember, that's not my life to play in. And I'm back to where I was with a rude awakening. Except for the next four weeks to follow, the original soundtrack will keep echoing. I'll become absorbed again when we watch the 40 episodes just to see if I can squeeze out a little bit of the same feelings. See if maybe I can form my life into the characters again, or if all the feelings are lost because I've started to rearrange the chemicals in my head. 
Eventually, I'll realize it's not working anymore. But nevertheless, I can find a different character to absorb. It's starting to make me wonder. What's my real personality? Because as far as I know, I'm just a concoction of a bunch of man-made leads. And now I'm not sure what makes me happy, because every other thought of mine belongs to a character who only exists in a fictional timeline. I've become an actor, playing the role of my own life. Except I've lost the script, forgot all the lines, the director won't say cut, and I have no idea which scene I'm in. The producers took a leave, and the camera crew's on break. The editor's all laughing, the male lead showed up. Late. The side characters are just as confused, giving interviews about how none of this makes sense. I'm the last one standing, the only one left on deck. But really, if I'm honest, it's not really me, because this was never my personality. What's left standing is the shell of a body that gave up. The leftover crumbs of someone who hated herself too much, and now she's not sure where she's supposed to stand, because not a thought in her head is original, not a single moment unscripted. You know what we haven't even talked about yet? We haven't even talked about prizes. Prizes! prizes. I mean, that's, that might be why some people are here. I don't know. Um, so provided by the Friends of the Deer Park Library, there's amazing prizes. If you are part of Friends of the Deer Park Library, will you just give us a wave real quick? I'm, I, I can't see you guys, so you're going to have to let me know if people are raising their hands by applauding. for. I guess not. All right. Um, so anyway, uh, they've provided a first place prize of $150, second place $100, and third place $50. So we're giving away some money tonight. Yeah. All right. Let's hear some scores from Janelle. Oh, it's a 10. Fitz, 9.3. Mark. 9.0, Mark, 9.2, Meredith, 9.2, all right. Hey, that score counted. Good job. Um, all right, let's get some final scores. This one's going to be high, everybody. Twenty-seven point seven. All right, out of Riverside High School, it's Ulyssa Iniguez. What we, us, they, them, she, her, he, him are doing is killing ourselves because we, us, they, them, she, her, he, him want to prove to ourselves, prove to ourselves that we are one of you and you are one of us and that we all are the same. What we all want to be same, same with a capital S. I don't want to be same because same number one walks around wearing tight shirts, showing off their nothing of a stomach and their six ribs. Same number one has everything but empathy. So why did I comment hashtag same on a pic posted six weeks ago by my now dead best friend known as wannabe same number one if I didn't want to be same number one but I was friends with the wannabe? Would that make me want to be Vila from Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire too? And don't get me started on same number two. I knew same number two. She wasted her mother's face learning how to cut and paste. And who was the wannabe of the same number two? Well, she harmed same number two for sleeping with her boyfriend. She was pretty filled with that jealousy because she never felt enough because she wasn't enough. She was only enough to be the wannabe of her best friend. So she puckered up her lips until she suffocated. And this is just wannabe same number one. And two, so do not be surprised when the suicide rate of teens is rising over 62% in the last 10 years. 
Because we, us, they, them, she, her, he, him, are feeling pressured to play same role. No one will love us if we're unattractive is what we're forced to think, but that's because of the shame and the insults we get in the hallways. What about on Insta? What about the filters on Snap that make your face look thinner, your eyelashes longer, your lips plumper, your, your eyes shinier? Because Lens Studios believes it's the way we should look. We, us, they, them, she, her, he, him are killing ourselves. What are you going to do about it? I know what I'm going to do about it. Instead of attempting to kill myself and putting myself in a hospital for same, I'm going to live because there is something to live for and that's not same. All I hear from my peers is, I'm going to kill myself or kill yourself. Well, I think that it's time that I'm going to live for myself. And I think that it's time that you should do the same. Thank you. All right, Janelle, what do you got? 8.8, Fitz. 8.5, Mark. 9.2, Mark. 9.1, Meredith. 8.8. All right. All right, we near the end of the first round here. What's the score? 26.7. From Riverside High School, welcome to the stage, Ben Willis. Who am I? Three simple words, one not so simple question. Who am I? The words hurl themselves at me like a bolt of lightning, the electricity ringing through my mind. Who, what, where, when, why, how am I me? I hesitate. The thoughts, they resonate in my mind. The words, they linger in my throat. Am I supposed to state the facts? Or should I recite every note of my life? The facts are simpler. I express them in a whimper. One by one, I state them. My name, my age, what I am doing with my life, but no, 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 this is not right, this is not the who, this is the what, but I feel like I do not have the gut to say it all. And the what is what they want, but the who is what is true, so I take a leap and let my thoughts run wild back to the times of a young, young child. I whisper to the child, who am I? The child just smiles as I let out a sigh. You see, back then, it was different. I was different. No facade to hide my innermost feelings. If I was happy, I laughed out loud. If I was sad, I cried out until my eyes had no more tears to shed. But then, life hit me. So many people, so many places, so many thoughts, so many faces, and many, many, many questions. The most prevailing one being, where do I go from here? Well, the seemingly best option would be to, first, find some people, and second, figure out how to fit in. Alrighty then, just suck it up and go for it. See who they want me to be and be that. Everything goes as planned. I begin to fit in. And before I know it, I begin to fit in everywhere I go. And simply by editing and modifying who I am. Copying here, pasting there, and most of all, subtracting. Hiding what is underneath. Turning those feelings inward. Stopping the flow of the river and diverting it back upon myself. So that my mind fills to the extremities till I can't hold it any longer. Wanting to scream, wanting to shout. Be who they want me to be. Be what they want me to be. The true me expanding and inflating like a balloon. Filling up and filling up the nitrogen, the helium, the oxygen, the elements of my emotions set in motion building up so as not to break free from those who like me for the me I have chosen to be expanding, inflating too much, too much, too much pop there goes the last of what was once me for I am who you need me to be I wear the clothes that you wove upon my body to hide what was once there until those clothes seeped into my flesh and blood and made me what I am so, who am I? That's up to you to decide. Personally, I think it would be easier to go ahead and ask, what am I? (laughs) 
I have to say, this is one of the best first rounds of a poetry slam I've ever been to. And I've, uh, that might sound weird, but I've actually been to a lot of them. Um, so really well done, poets. You guys are blowing us away. Tonight. All right, Janelle, what do you got? 9.3, Fitz, 9.0, Mark, 9.0, Mark, 8.7, Meredith, 8.9. All right. Final score. 26.9. I'm not I'm not great at math and adding or any of that stuff, but I think it's really close. Is it really close? I think it's really close. All right. From Lakeside High School, pre- please welcome Elijah Bonham. <laughs> The world, the world I live in. The world I live in is not how I thought. From the playing of make-believe, being the princess in the stories we read, to the constant thought of studying to get good grades to make our parents proud. The world I live in is not what I want. Worn out from the thought of school or waking up is tiring. Waking up to just feel tired all day, listening to music on full volume, drowning out the world, words of the world, the words from my teachers, my parents, my loved ones, the words from my soul, my mind, my heart. I choose to lock away, to lock away the feelings and flaws the world contains. The flaws that become bigger and bigger till we can't put them aside until it's all we see, until our eyes can't lock away the sadness and despair, the despair, which becomes all we feel, choosing to not leave the loss of hope, the meaning of despair. We can't lock away, it's all we see. To become that inner child we always wanted to be, the child we wanted to set free, to play make-believe, be that princess we always dreamt, the kid we should have been, the child to be able to smile, cry, to be happy, the life we should have had, the dreams we wanted to dream and love, the passion of love, of smiling and laughing, not having a care in the world to just be young, to be young, not stressing about our day we have coming up or that big test we can't afford to fail, the studying to make our parents impressed, or the work towards getting that permit to be able to drive ourselves, or a license being so close by, the job we need to get to get the money of our future lives, our future life of which we don't know what's come to be, the life we plan and hope to happen, which is just a fantasy, the fantasy we hope to come true, not thinking of the downs, but just the ups, the world, not the messes or the flaws, but the beauty, the beauty in the world, not the disasters, the sights, the towns and the cities, the people or places to go, it as a it as a whole. Why think about the bad when we can think about the good? Why think about the test we just failed when we can think about the hard work we did? We shouldn't be worried about the worst of what can happen, but what the good can bring and be. The good of which can will always be there as long as we look for it. To be that happy child who makes mistakes, not worrying about the consequences, but instead of how to achieve more greatness from learning from it. To be smiling and happy with ourselves, the work and dreams we have. To be ourselves not fitting into anyone else's ideals, to be happy and young, a child, a teen, a person, someone who can be themselves, happy and free. Thank you. All right, we got intermission coming up shortly. But first, we're going to have one more poet after the scores from this round. Janelle? 7.5. Fitz, 7.4. Mark, 7.5. Mark, 7.0. Meredith, 7.2. All right. um, So uh, very shortly, we're going to have our last poet of the round. Then we are going to know the winner of the... Oh, the I slam, therefore I am trophy. It's so clever. I forgot it. Um, let's get the total score. 22.1. All right. Our final poet of the first round. Please welcome Justin Bellinger.
I walked down the hall one day, eyes glaring at me. I asked them why. You're a man, they said. All men, they said. But I didn't do anything wrong. No, nothing at all. But because I'm a man, I'm a criminal, a fugitive, a person lost to evil. These glares pierce into my skin. Day after day after day they do. Lying helpless under the weight of your views. What I think doesn't matter when others don't agree. I need to be someone else to fit in with your creed. I, they say these things to me. I don't understand. I just want to be me. I don't understand. I don't understand. Don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. What a wimp, they said. All Men don't cry, they said. They must be strong and proud, like Chuck, like Dwayne, like other men in the world. But I'm not like them, not like the strong of heart. I feel, I cry, I sob, I wail, but no one hears me. No one takes notice of my cries, because I'm a man, they said. Be tough, they said. And they wonder why we don't come for comfort, why we don't run to the arms of those we should. We don't do this because we think we will be viewed as less, less than the other men who we think are the epitome of men. This cliche hurts our inner being, telling us we aren't enough, not strong enough, not proud enough, not as good as the others. Some don't want this cliche, but feel like they must have it, for if they don't possess it, they'll be alone. We are taught to keep our armor on, for keeping this armor won't show our wounds. We can't show that we're hurt. It's not what we're supposed to be. We must be like those who use this armor as a shield of their being. There is nothing wrong with having this armor, but just like the knights who some aspire to be, we must have, we must take it off from time to time. We must have vulnerability, as our ability to have strong friendships and relationships is absent without it. So I'll walk down that hallway once more, ignoring the glares of those who judge. For I don't always feel proud, for I don't always feel tough, but I am me either way, more than the cliches that bound us as people. Thank you. Let's get another round of applause for the whole first round. I'll just hold this for a minute. All right, now what do you got? 8.1, Fitz. 8.0, Mark. 8.4, Mark. 8.0, Meredith. 8.0. They kind of agreed. Um, all right, final score. 24.1! All right, and we are very shortly going to have the winner of the I Slam, Therefore I Am trophy. And then uh, while we're waiting for them to tabulate, um, poets, there's some drinks and stuff up by the judges' table for you to get ready for that next round. And then we're going to take a little break right after I announce the winner of the I Slam, Before, Therefore I Am trophy. Should I really put the pressure on? Should we do a drum roll? Could be a really long drum roll. I have no, no idea how long it's going to take him to do this. Yeah, keep the pressure on him. Keep the pressure on. Yeah, we should just start pounding.
Will you just point to the one that won? Lakeside High School! Uh, will Coach Alicia Singh please come to the stage and accept your trophy? Mrs. Singh? No? Oh, we're, we're demanding a recount. They're protesting your decision. Okay. As our MC would have announced. I'm not that good at this job. Uh, the scores are uh, taken collectively as an average, but we've got a formula so that if your school is smaller, you are not penalized for that. So it was very, very close. Riverside came out at 22.81 and Lakeside came out at 23.18. Really, really close. Excellent job, poets. So uh, I believe last year this trophy stayed here at Riverside, but this year it will stay at Lakeside until next year when you compete for it again. All right, if you guys will bring the house lights up, we are going to take a short intermission and be back for round two. Let's go, round two! All right. We have less energy than we did for round one, and I don't like it. All right, uh, the following poets have broken to the second round. It's Ben Willis, Ulyssa Iniguez, Crean Jarman, Ariana Reamer, Elena Brown, Charlie Markhart, and Gracie Mayer. And those poets are moving on to the Northern versus Valley Grand Slam on April 24th. So come back and see them then. All right, we do have a slight point deduction uh, to factor in for Gracie Mayer, a time deduction for that first poem, but it doesn't change the final rankings of the poem. So let's get round two underway. For round two, the poets are required to have a completely new poem that they perform. Same time requirements, same judging scores and judging rubrics, but this time harder because now we have very high expectations of them. Let's welcome to the stage Ben Willis. Click, flash, darkness, exposure. The process of photography and the way of our life. First, the click. 13.8 billion years ago. As one speck of energy became a spectacular envisionment of dark and light. As a million questions and a million answers materialized, gliding amongst the budding stars and galaxies, forever evading collision calling out to anyone who would hear. Who clicked the button? How? Why? What created this universe? We argue and we lie because we don't know. Was it Adam's brewing on a celestial eve or was it the creation of Adam and Eve? We don't know. And so we're scared. Scared by this idea of nothing becoming something. Because if nothing can become something, can something become nothing? So as the questions form the pixels and the stars they form the light, a photo is born. Then, flash. The bulb on the flash bulb camera of reality ignites and breaks to smithereens as the star in the center of our world is broken. Because someday the sun will be gone. Someday we will live in darkness. Someday something will become nothing. And when that day comes, we will be lost, hopeless, broken, broken beyond repair, broken to the point where we cannot thrive or be alive because we cannot imagine life without light. Because that means we have no basis for discrimination, no way stop on the way to the Liberty Station, no way to see what's on the surface, no way to pick and choose somebody else's purpose. Because once the light is gone, we are in our most vulnerable state, a state where we have no way to judge each other. And that scares us, a state that tears us apart, a state that brings us together, a state of not knowing what to do. Because when we are young, we are told that the sun will always shine, will be there no matter what. As we go through life, through the ups and downs, the growing up and the graduation gowns, the sun will shine. 
Rising in the east, setting in the west, this is the one thing that time cannot test. But what then will happen when the day comes as we waste our lives away, barely heeding the beating drums? The earth stuck in limbo, humanity stuck within itself, stuck in the world of despair it has created. This world of without light is a world of fright because how can one possibly sleep through the night knowing that the darkness has conquered the light? Finally, exposure. As the photo develops in the dark room of humanity, of reality, we see ourselves in the course of humanity, all in a photograph of darkness. This darkness exposes us to the truth, to the way we've been raised to judge others from our youth. Now life is placed blatantly on a piece of paper, and we see how it is, but only later when nothing can be done. And we think, as the last lights begin to dim, wondering, are we scared of the darkness, or are we scared of ourselves? Good job, Ben. All right, uh, I, got a, I got a company line for you. The Friends of Deer Park Library raise money for events like this by having book sales. Um, so look for their book sales at Deer Park Auto Freight this summer. I am someone who owns too many books, so I'm probably going to be there. Um, let's get some scores. Janelle, what do you got? 9.1, Fitz. 9.0, Mark. 9.0, Mark. 8.0, Meredith, 9.2. All right, your second poet in the second round is Ulyssa Iniguez. I had absolutely no idea how to start this poem. I mean, I even searched up slam poetry topics for high school. And to make matters worse, 11 topics came up. They were no good, but they were good. But to make a decision between those 11 would be so much better than to make a decision between 1 billion to the power of 12, because there's just that many topics to choose from. And that's just topics. What about the style? What about the form? What about the way I make my poem sound? What about the way my hands fly around? Should it be happy, sad, crappy, mad? Boy, am I glad that I went with happy. <laughs> there are so many decisions to make, but it seems like I never make the right one. Anyways, enough of that. What outfit should I wear tomorrow? Should it be pink or blue? Because I have two really cute outfits in those colors. But what should I choose? Should I choose to study for that test I have tomorrow? Or should I choose to go to Ryan's party that I should be getting ready for pronto? I never make the right one. Should I choose to be happy or sad today? I always choose the second one. So should I choose to be sad or happy today? Oh, but I chose the first one that time. Moms, did you guys send your guys' kids to school with enough confidence today? Should they go to that school? Is it a good school? Should they even go to school or should they go to public or should they go to private school? Older siblings, we struggle with whether or not we want our younger siblings to grow up. Should they wear that? Is mom going to tell them or is that me? Or is that my job? What is my job? Younger siblings, will my, my, my big brother still like me? Will he yell at me or will sis judge me? Fathers, do you want to play a game of golf or will you be watching the Sunday football game? Do you want to help mom out with the kids? No. Anyways, they're always going to choose the choice with the words game in it. Unless fathers believe that leaving their kids and letting us wander all of our lives when... Letting us wander all of our lives when our fathers will come back and why he left in the first place. And was it our faults? Why do I think these things, the decisions I make from pondering these questions, these choices, these decisions, why do I always make the wrong ones? Everybody says, everybody makes mistakes is what I'm always hearing, but my mistakes, but mine are from bad decisions I've made. 
But to be honest, I feel as though I see myself making, I see myself and others making more mistakes than making decisions that can change the rest of our lives. I mean, why was it so difficult for me to choose a topic for this poem? Why was it so difficult for me to wake up in the morning and pick the clothes out that I was going to wear for the rest of the day? And why do I find it so difficult to pick positivity over negativity? It shouldn't be that difficult, but it is, and that's what scares me the most. For when it comes down to you and your choices, what will you choose? Thank you. All right, tell round two. It's going to be a heavyweight fight. We're coming out swinging. Coming out swinging. All right, what do you got, Janelle? 9.3 fits. 8.3 mark. 9.1 mark. 8.5 Meredith. 7.9. Ooh. Ooh. I know that saved you, Fitz. That was that was almost really embarrassing. All right, what do we got for a final score? 25.9. Please welcome back, Crean German. The rocker on the porch creaks as she sets her heels back again to continue the hypnotic motion. He's lighting one cigarette after another, downing a bottle of liquids I won't name. Their kids are long since grown, living on their own, and happy to be away. Because the sound of the rocker creaking used to mean trouble, and the smell of cigarette smoke meant the same but double, running home after the streetlights turned on, and leaving certain words out of certain sentences to protect those we love. Blue slips to see the counselor for those same words accidentally spoken. Calls from CPS agents saying that the neighbors turned us in, being hushed at all moments because my words were never good enough to be said, simply a waste of oxygen. The wood on the front porch is rotting, as are the walls inside. The termites of their lives finally found a way to hide. When the kids left, and the sun set, and the smoke turned into a lifestyle, when the creaking of the rocker meant judgmental eyes and no smiles, when the disgusting yellow paint began to peel and no Christmas had seen family for 20 years or more, no knocks approached the front door. No children sneaking in the back. The penny-pinching father no longer had money to hold back. All that remains standing is a cell with a self-service lock, a DNR, a key, and a note expressing no love. A couple sitting out front from dusk till dawn wondering why they feel so wronged. Why his cigarettes had to leave scars. Why her wooden spoon was never used for cooking. Why their children left when they thought they'd reached a common understanding. Why the world seemed to turn their back when all they ever did was raise their kids the same way their parents had. And the ones before them. And even farther back. Today's not recorded in journals with places that don't exist on maps. They're wondering why they're ostracized when society has so often done the same. They simply don't have money to cover up their lies. No connections to give voices of character on the witness stand. No family willing to help their kids. For generations to come, their kids will do the same. Find tools to destroy what they said they cared for in such a way of life or death, but not theirs, never theirs, always someone else's. The rocker creaks again. The lighter's flame grows. The termites in the walls moved out a while ago and took up occupation at the homes of their children, where they watched as the same family dynamic was created. And behind the drywall, hushed words are being spoken saying they're moving in a direction just south of parenting. If you like what you hear tonight, uh, I have another opportunity for you. We have Broken Mike, an all-ages weekly poetry open mic. That's at 6.30 every Wednesday at Nido Burrito downtown on 1st in Spokane. 
Uh, it's sometimes held at Auntie's Bookstore. Um, that's three minute, Mike. It's it's on my same bullet point. So are you trying to do my job for me? <laughs> okay. There's another event called Three Minute Mike at Auntie's Bookstore, um, and both of these events are available to students under 21. So you can go. It's fine. All right. Let's get some scores. Janelle, what do you got? A ten. Fitz, another ten. Mark, a third ten. Mark, another ten. And Meredith, a nine. You, you did not realize when you woke up today how many people were going to boo you, did you? you? You had no idea. No idea. All right. Let's give a warm welcome to Ariana Reamer. Monday was a stressful day. You could call it an a la carte day. A day out of the ordinary. A day I wish I was a dead plate. I feel my heart thudding in my chest as the head chef looks me up and then down. And I feel a dread rise up when he tells me that everybody else is too busy to do it. I have to make a dish. A dish for a food critic. I might as well let them make me the main course. I feel the dread in my gut grow as I read that dupe. My vision feels blurry. I can barely make out the words mushroom steak, mushroom soup, and steak done medium rare. I blame Brittany's god awful handwriting for that one. <laughs> I quickly spin around. There is no time to waste when trying to frantically and practically make a mise en place. Under the intimidating glare of the head chef, I start to cook. I can hear my heart pounding. I am just the shoe in this kitchen, inexperienced and in the spotlight's maleficence. My anxiety is causing me to up mess up. <sighs> I fire up the steak rather quickly as orders around me go in and out. Dinner rush is always hard, but today it seems even harder. Karma sure came back to kick me for being late to work, huh? When I finally finish the order, I panic again. Because I didn't finish the order. I made a mistake. I use the condensed broth in the bottom of the pan that nobody uses as a gravy. I have never felt so stupid before in my life. Or maybe I have. I remember making mistakes before. Not studying for my Spanish test, making me saco una nota mala. Not practicing my poetry, making me fumble and tumble with my words. There are so many mistakes that I've made before, but I can't seem to draw myself away from this one. I feel sick to my stomach as I watch the waitress open the door to the back kitchen. Britt, I ask as my mood sickens. She looks pale, like a piece of underdone chicken. But she grins at me. Two Michelin stars, all because of my stupid mistake. And the things that happened after that were better. I got a promotion, and I started taking online Spanish classes, all because of a Michelin star mistake. My luck is running out. All right, let's get some scores. Janelle, what do you got? 9.1, Fitz. 9.0, Mark. 9.0, Mark. 8.5, Meredith. 8.9.
wasn't the lowest this time. All right, what's our uh, what's our tally? Twenty six point nine. One more round of applause for Eleanor Brown. Society is full of kids grown up too fast. Kids who can get the dream of growing up out of their heads. They watch the grown ups who never really grew up and wish they could be old instead. So instead of living out their youth, they took tic tacs like pills and never knew that way too fast they'd be popping pills like tic tacs. They smoked peppermint sticks and licorice, and about a second later, they were smoking cigarettes because that candy was a gateway drug to aging prematurely. We took shots of juice and chased that high without thinking clearly. And while we were distracted, chasing the high of childhood, we grew up. Society is full of kids grown up too fast. One moment we're marrying our Barbies, hoping mom will bring home Arby's, then five minutes later, we're late for the ceremony, joining two in holy matrimony, and one of them is you. The other is your kindergarten crush, but instead of a ring pop or a piece of tied-up string, it's diamonds and a gold-banded ring. Society is full of kids not grown at all. They had a tragic happening that left their hearts and brains about three sizes too small. They're adults, but they're faking. But, um... Like a fine wine or aged cheese, but the winery had a mix-up and the dairy a new employee. Now that wine's nothing but grape juice, so the toddler's not yet grown, and that cheese is curds not well-matured without a purpose on this earth. Society is full of kids not grown at all. Grown men and women not properly taught, throwing temper tantrums. A lot. Instead of over ice cream or the brother's fun new toy, it's over politics and opinions and how others find their joy because someone else's business is a personal offense, when really they just feel the need to force in their two cents. Society is full of kids not grown at all, abandoned by their education, leaving them with their emotions that help you dot your I's and cross your T's and mind your P's and Q's, but won't teach you how to feel your feels or say your words or how to know it's true because the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And 8 plus 4 is 12, but taxes? They can go to hell. Society is full of kids. To say it simply, I won't kid. We're all trying to play adult, playing dress up in mom's closet and it's nobody's fault. We're trying on dad's suit and tie, but it's baggy and it's dragging on the floor and we're choking because we tied the tie way too tight and we're stepping into our future in our mom's old high heels. But there's a lot of room for growing and we're shuffling our feet because society is full of kids. Kids grown up too fast, not grown at all, growing at last. And I hope these kids can look to the past at the wall with the tick marks, the very own height map, and see how far they've come from the time when they were just kids. And even though they grew up too fast, at least these kids are learning, allowed their childhood at last. All right, let's get some scores. Janelle, 9.3. Fitz, another 9.3. Mark, 9 even. Mark, 9.8. And Meredith, 9.4. You know, I used to, uh, I did this, this slam years ago, and I used to tell a bunch of, like, cheesy dad jokes up here. Um, but I'm, I'm not a dad. Uh, so I always felt like a faux pas. That's good, right? All right, what's the final score? 28 points! All right, our penultimate poet, which means second to last for those of you who don't speak Latin, uh, is Charlie Marcourt!
Summer Rain. When I die, do not look for me in sunsets. Do not look for me in the trees with golden light streaming through the branches or the waves crested with foam. You will not find me there. When I die, do not look for me in the house with no trim or the scriptures that you read. You will not find me there. When I die, do not look for me in the words that my parents write about my life or the tears that they shed. You will not find me there. Instead, look for me in my school. You will find me huddled in the corner, counting my breaths, waiting for my wave of panic to pass. You will find me on this stage, nervous but overjoyed because I am home. You will find me laughing with my peers, crying in the bathroom, and stressing over my grades. Look for me and my siblings. You will find me in the brother that I spent years of my life hiding with. You will find me in the brother that loves rocks and Legos. You will find me in sister one's red hair and diagnosed anxiety at the age of seven. You will find me in sister two's love for books and learning. You will find me in sister three's hair dye and tears. Look for me and my friends. You will find me in their smile lines and sore stomachs. You will find me in their playlists and quote books. You will find me helping them with their homework and in the silence that listens to their studying. You will find me talking them through every panic attack and mental breakdown. You will find me at every single concert, poetry slam, and track meet. Look for me in the love I have given. For I do not wish to be remembered as broken and a victim to my brain. My circumstances are not my fault, though my reaction is all my own, and for that I am sorry. So, when I die, do not look for me in sunsets. Look for me in the tears of my brothers and sisters. Look for me in the words of my friends. Look for me in those who always wonder. And finally, look for me in summer rain. Psyching myself up for that last time up the stairs. It's coming. It's coming. All right. Scores. Jill, 9.3. Vitz, 9.5. Mark, 9.3. Mark, 10. And Meredith, 9.3. 28.1. All right, our final poet for the evening is Gracie Mayer. Hi. My name is Gracie Mayer Winston. Um, <laughs> um, this poem is called Dog Eared Corners. I hide very vulnerable safety information in the hidden pockets of my room. And I hope when I am hiding in a classroom during a school shooting, I can tell my parents where it is. The directions give them what they need. I have a playlist for my funeral and all the writing I never got to publish and all the people I never got to say goodbye to. All the people I didn't get to say I love you to one last time. All my secrets and my regrets and I know they'll cringe but at least they'll have more than enough to remember me by. I guess after planning my own death so many times I still want to have my own affairs in order. I'm 17 and suicide is no longer a threat but homicide still is. And I can tell I'll be on the list of the victims on the news after the school shooting. Because I lag behind in gym class. I know where I stand, and I know what I want from my death. I'm prepared. I've always been a planner. I think about things so much, I've just never been that good at doing. I'm inefficient and imperfect, and I know that's human, but I guess I expect myself to be an insect and a robot at the same time. A robo-insect, who wonders if they'll survive high school or college, or be one of the lucky few who gets to leave without a bullet wound. In America, we love guns. And I guess there will be one that sings to me while I sleep. Resting its weary head by my gravestone. 
singing about how the robo insect has had its ex simultaneous exoskeleton and batteries taken out. They powered down. And someone could have stopped the extraction. Well, people tried, but America loves extraction. Tinkering around with what metal we make, the cockroaches and tech companies have united cockroach metal news, so die! So don't keep the paper stuck in the dog-eared corners of your room, a book left open in a library, make it unhidden. That's what America wants. Think this. I hear the fire drill bell ring, and I drop everything. And I know that we're not supposed to bring anything, not even a jacket. I still take my phone, and I walk out the door. I don't even have pockets to put it in, so I'm carrying it awkwardly while my head spins. Paranoia invigorating adrenaline. And it's cold, but we don't talk about it, and I don't feel it until we're silent. We laugh about it. And my friend brings her saxophone because she values its life over hers. And I bring my phone because I value just the possibility of telling my parents that I love them one last time above my own life. And I'm able to say that I know I will be on the list of the victims on the news after the school shooting. Here's another reason I bring my phone when I'm scared. To tell my parents to not accept the lousy excuses that our government and even our community will give. They will say that God just wanted their little angel back a little bit early. They're in a better place, and they're loved so much more than they were here. We laugh about this. Even though I don't think Alyssa Aldehaf is laughing, or Joy Price is laughing, or the rest of the m massive number of people, children, for that matter, are laughing. We feel left behind. Thank you. Let's give one more round of applause for all of our poets tonight. Fantastic. All right, let's get some final scores from Janelle. 9.8, Fitz. 9.5, Mark 9.5, Mark 10, Meredith 10. Hey! I think those scores are going to be worth some money. All right, we're going to tabulate final scores over here, and then we're going to take off. Do not forget, the seven poets you just saw are going to be competing at the Grand Slam on April 24th. Location and details are in your program. Final score is 27.3 for Gracie. One more for Gracie. I'm going to bust out the dad jokes. Why do you have an extra sock while you're golfing? In case you get a hole in one. In your sock, a hole in your... I, I don't think you guys heard me. Is a hole in one like one sock? And that's that's a thing in oh, you, you guys you guys are no fun. You guys are no fun. Why did the pony need a glass of water? He was a little horse. Oh I oh I have more. I asked all of my classes for bad jokes today, just in case of this eventuality. Um what noise does a condescending bear make? Panda. I liked that one. That was one of my favorites. There's a problem, though. When I was little, I was so bad at grammar. I was playing in the yard, and I fell down a good. <laughs> fell down a good? No, you don't. In third place, winning $50. Charlie Markhart! <laughs> In second place, winning $100 is Eleanor Brown! <laughs> In first place, you already know who it is, it's Crean Jarman! <laughs> Uh, 
it is really hard to sit up here and be abused by the audience and by the MC. So one more round of applause for our judges. Round of applause for the 